Why We Live by Stephen Garnett The Arnie Isles What kind of name is that? It's almost as if someone took the middle letters of their surname and added some little dots above the E to give it a sort of foreign look. They're probably British and think that a nation based on a bunch of random islands is a perfectly logical place to base a country. Well, it's a start. Several years later, and the shape of this archipelago, its myriad forests, rivers, lakes, mountain chains, bays, and other geographical features, are as vividly recalled in my mind as anywhere else on this strange little planet. The names of its islands, its northerly capital, the bulging headland jutting out into the westerly sea, the placement and characteristics of its towns and cities, all etched into my memory for life. I had always been from Liverside. That was obvious. I liked the name. A once commanding port on the east coast of North Ronway, the largest of the isles. The city was founded in the mouth of a great river that reached its terminus roughly halfway up the coast, approximately where the liver is found on a human torso. This was no coincidence. One thing I had not always been was a professional football player and a champion at that. These things need to be earned. However, after just four seasons managing and playing at the top flight, Steve Timson was twice winner of the Premier League and holder of the Golden Boot. Both Timson and Liverside becoming legends of their time. The imagination is an incredible force. You can do anything, be anyone, live in any time or place. But first, breakfast. What, though, are we escaping from? The imagination can inspire our future actions while we constantly drift through the present. We can cast our mind backwards into the shadows of the past, recalling fond memories, being haunted by others. Or we can delve into alternate realities, potential futures, unreachable, impossible, and forbidden scenarios. The imagination allows one to process, understand, learn, experiment, hypothesize, be stimulated, be entertained, fantasize, and escape. I look up beyond the countless carcasses that litter the smouldering earth. The sky is darkling yet still distinctly blood-red. Smoke billows from guns, machines, and swathes of fire. My nostrils have become accustomed to the stench of sulphur and death, just as my ears no longer ring from the relentless blasting of ordnance or the screams of the wounded. Another wave is coming, a swarm that paints the land black as they approach, like spilt ink on a fresh parchment. They endeavour to consume everything in their path. It matters not. We know no fear. Commander, there is a breach in our left flank at coordinates 115183, over. The comms cut in. Static crackles. Gunfire distorts their speech. The voice is assertive but unwavering. Order Chaplain Cassius to lead three reserve squads of tactical marines into that breach. Inform him that the assault terminators are at his disposal. They have deep strike capabilities and can reinforce his position whenever necessary. Hold the line, Captain. <laughs> Understood, sir. For the Emperor! Let his will be done. <laughs> The advance of those bugs must be slowed. Ultramar Defence Fleet, 
This is Chapter Master Marnius Kalgar requesting orbital bombardment. Grid 1182. Fire for effect. Sure, copy, Commander. Orbital strike will commence immediately. They will not stop. They do not tire or break. We will have to eradicate this infestation through their utter annihilation. Mac Ragger will be cleansed of this alien scum. A blinding flash of light, followed by a tunnel of white flame that appears to part the very atmosphere of the planet. The forms of individual insects suddenly become visible, illuminated momentarily as if caught in the headlights of a speeding vehicle. Vile faces contorted by hate and hunger, mouths of teeth, bile and reaching tongues like arrowheads, bodies of horn, claw and bladed limb, encased in an armoured carapace, pouring forward on six limbs at a speed that seemed to defy their size. The smallest gaunt, easily the length and breadth of a man. A sound as if the planet's crust were being cracked open by a jackhammer, engulfed all other noise. Thunder, cannon fire, a space shuttle blasting its thrusters. No sound came close to this. The hammer of Thor was more akin to the power of this might. The planet surfaced the anvil. The tyrannid biomass, the subject to be worked. The swarm ahead continued to rush forth, unaffected by the instantaneous destruction of thousands of their brethren. Well, let them come. As darkness swept back across the foes of the Imperium, and the ringing of tinnitus faded to be replaced by the din of the ongoing mayhem, fresh clips were fitted into weapons, Aim was taken, and orders awaited. There was much work to be done. Why, though, do we fight? What do we work for? What is our objective, our purpose, the meaning of life? For those fighting off in the distant future, living in a galaxy where there is naught but war, Perhaps their path is clear. Likewise for those that came hundreds of years before us. Were the minds of most able to comprehend their position in the world, or their place along the timeline of human civilization and this planet? Could little else be thought of other than their sustenance, reproduction, and survival? Can the pursuit of happiness and fulfillment fit into either of these worlds? And is it truly possible, even today, as I sit in relative comfort and form this sentence? What exactly do we live for, and why? Is there a greater purpose? Are we fated souls, destined to tread a certain road, whether one of luxury, poverty, happiness, or despair? Perhaps all existence is simply a glorious dance of random events. Conversely, at the heart of this chaos, are there systems that can be understood? Time for lunch. Running alongside the lake is always a cleansing experience. It's not that I really use the time to think about a particular issue, or to plan a particular task. Often, it's quite the opposite. A distraction. A way of consuming myself with little more than this slice of the physical world that I am currently in contact with. A way to be completely absorbed in the moment. To capture that essence of being alive. And to become more in tune with my primordial senses. I know. How bohemian. How revelatory. What next? How I became the next disciple of Carpe Diem culture. Because YOLO, right? I'm not trying to bring to your attention a world-changing epiphany here. But I do find it interesting to consider what makes us happy and why. It feels important to highlight ways in which we succeed in finding happiness, 
whether as individuals, as a society, or as the human race in general, in order to make good choices in the future. Of course, what it means to be happy is completely subjective, albeit with reoccurring themes of a sense of well-being, joy, and contentment, naturally linked to acknowledgement, achievement, and fulfilment, as well as friendship, companionship, and that eternal, elusive mystery of man, love. A feeling of being truly free, I would argue, is at the core of happiness. And yet many of these aforementioned factors seem to become conflicted with what it means to be free. We also have an awareness of duty, and a need for purpose and control. Freedom itself, though, clearly comes in many forms, but generally speaking, could be said as having the ability to act or change without constraint. However, is this concept ever truly possible to accomplish? And how does this alter our psychology, our actions, and our dreams? The sun on my back the expanse of calm water behind me. A light breeze becomes audible as the dried leaves whisper and stir. The voice is soothing, with no apparent form or structure, but not without melody. Nature's breath brings also the scent of change. Detritus sodden with yesterday's rain is pungent, musky sweet with decay, as the forest prepares to take shelter from the coming cold. Boughs appear to cling to their foliage, even as they dry in the morning light. Imperceptible tremors travel through the bodies of the trees, and they are forced to shiver, gradually casting off their autumn coats, leaf after leaf. A forceful gust disturbs a mound of leaves, stimulating a spontaneous dance about the fingers of the wind. Lighter than the air, they seem. Alive. Woodland fairies, jubilant and carefree. But the flurry also brings with it another scent. A subtle, though distinctly foul, stench. Something akin to rotten eggs, though altogether more unpleasant. My nostrils intuitively twitch, further exposing the highly tuned receptors to the surrounding air, drawing in breath to be almost instantaneously analysed. Electrical currents flow, nerve impulses the catalyst for chemical release. Suddenly my mind locks onto an answer which triggers the next action with the speed of a lightning strike. I run. Owl said this would happen. I should have listened. Blood and heat surges through my body. My limbs and senses work in synergy to guide me through the lattice of roots and stones, the tangles of bracken and branch, and the undulating ground with little difficulty, despite the swiftness of footfall. Urgent yet composed, powerful yet almost silent, with any sound further suppressed by the damp earth. My tail acts like a rudder, counterbalancing every movement, and my whiskers guide this rush through the undergrowth with precision. I am hardly aware of the uncountable decisions being made with every beat of my heart. Every fibre of my existence is being guided by the need to survive. To live. I am alive. This is what it feels like to be alive. Foxy! I recognise the owner of this exclamation immediately. Badger. They're coming, Foxy! You know what to do. I have to get home. I dare not pause, though I'm tiring as I continue to run. I'm scared, but I have to get home. Man... The destroyer. More relentless than a rushing stream after the winter thaw, they seem. Consuming without mercy or care. 
Is this the price? Are we not all equal? Why must so many suffer for the benefit of the few? Why must so many live in fear and oppression, while others live as gods? This world gives them life, but they must destroy it to fulfil their own selfish desires. When will they stop? When will they change? When will it all end? I just want to go home. I just want to be free. I shouldn't have listened to him. He doesn't give a shit about what's best for me. All he sees is the job. I couldn't let the others down. Yeah, look where that got me. White Walls A white door with a small rectangular window showing the gloomy form of a corridor beyond. Bare white walls, except where it seems something once hung. Silver scratch marks emanating from a narrow, vacant cavity left behind by a once-embedded nail, resemble a rudimentary cross. I wonder if that was intentional. Sand-coloured curtains that remind me of my grandfather's living room wallpaper, discoloured by decades of heavy smoking, hang over a single exterior window. Some semblance of daylight highlights its frame. The floor, cheap linoleum, the furniture, a single cushioned chair with bare wooden arms that looks somewhat comfortable, but altogether uninviting. Oh, and the bed, approximately 80 centimetres across, fitted with crisp white linen, stiff, smelling weirdly unnatural. Where I lay. Another door presumably hides a toilet. Does that make it an ensuite bathroom? It sounds rather luxurious when you put it like that. I lean over and tentatively drag back a corner of the curtain. Metal bars running top to bottom greet me. Ah, yes. Home sweet home. I recognise nothing outside from the narrow view the window provides, although a perpendicular wall to the right restricts my gaze. Hemmed in further by a parallel wall jutting out across the line of sight. Ground floor. Bricks. Concrete. A path leading around the corner bordered by a rough hedge of sorts, with a slit of blue sky above. This was not my home, of course. I hadn't been allowed to go home.